different views, we're not going to always agree. Amen? Amen? Amen. Since relationship conflicts are inevitable, learning to deal with them is very important to build a healthy relationship. So when conflict is mismanaged, it can harm the relationship. But when we handle church conflict with respect and positivity, we will provide an opportunity for us to grow. Amen? Ultimately, strengthening the bond and the relationship with our other brothers and sisters by learning the skills that we need for a successful conflict resolution. You can keep your personal and professional relationship strong and growing. Now, I want us to also look at what conflict is. Conflict is a strong disagreement or collision of values, interests, or intentions among individuals, groups, organizations, communities, churches, and nations. It is a process that begins when one party perceives that another party has negatively affected or is about to negatively affect something that the first party cares about. So what am I saying? In other words, conflict is when the parties involved perceive a threat to their needs or to their interests or even to their concerns, and it causes a little bit of friction. Conflict can also be seen as selfish because usually the parties involved want to get their own way. And although this may be selfish, conflict is not always a negative thing. Conflict can also be productive and it can also be healthy, depending on how the parties handle the situation. Also, it is important for us to note that as Christians, we are to handle church conflict different than the world, amen? Because we are in the world, but we are not of the world, amen? God's word has specific instructions on how we, the church, should handle church conflict. Why? Because we are new creatures and we are called to a ministry of reconciliation, amen? Now, what is conflict resolution? Conflict resolution is the process of, the resolving, of resolving a dispute or a conflict by meeting at least some of each person's needs and addressing their interests. Knowing how to manage and resolve conflict is essential for having a productive work life, and it is also important for community and church and family life as well. Woo, Jesus. <laughs> there is a distinct difference between conflict and dispute. A dispute is a disagreement over a particular issue between two people or group. And a dispute is also short term. A common disagreement in church might be who gets to sing the solo part in the church play? And if a dispute arises over hours and they cannot resolve the dispute, usually someone with an authoritative figure comes in and decides to make the choice. Now, conflict, on the other hand, it results from continued disputes. So that means if we continue to argue and we cannot make a decision, it results in a full-grown conflict. As the frustration rises, it blows up even more. If the same persons that were in a dispute over the solo part continually dispute with one another over the task, for example, they begin to see each other as stubborn, as aggressive or hostile, and they develop a mutual dislike of one another. Now this can increase the dispute and eventually rebuild in full-blown conflict. Now I want us to also note that in conflict resolution, we may not always come to res resolve everything. Sometimes we must agree to disagree, amen? We can't always come to a resolution. But there has to be a meeting of the minds. We have to agree that somebody will get their way. That's how we fight right in resolving conflict 
resolution. Now, what are some of the root causes of conflict resolution? There are many root causes, but we're just going to talk about a few of them this morning. Now, one of the, the, the causes of uh, conflict, one of the root causes of conflict can be data. What am I saying? Incomplete information or inaccurate information can lead to conflict. For example, if I've been home and I, I've prepared a nice dinner for my spouse, and he calls me and say, honey, I'm on my way home from work. 10 minutes later, he's not home. 20 minutes later, he still hasn't arrived. 30 minutes later, he arrives through the door, but the reason why he's late is because he made a stop on the way, but he neglected to tell me that he was gonna make a stop. So because that information was not given to me, it can cause a conflict because I was ready for him to be home in 10 minutes and he came home in 30 minutes, amen? But if he had let me know that he was gonna make a stop on the way, then there would be no, no reason for any unnecessary conflict. So when we leave out important information when we're talking to someone, it can cause conflict. Another root cause for conflict is in relationships. Now that may involve strong emotions or poor communications. So it's very important for us when we're communicating with someone else to make sure that we give them all information. Oftentimes these conflicts in, re in relationships involve one party questioning the motives of the goodwill of another party's value. Now they have a different understanding of morality and they may have a different understanding of belief systems. And they also may have a different understanding of what is right and what is wrong. The difficult, it's difficult to resolve as parties may be unwilling to compromise on what they believe is true. And I like to call that being stubborn, amen? Some of us can be very stubborn, stubborn which causes conflict. Another root cause of conflict would be interest. Different perceptions of the interest involved, conflict of interest often resolve through creative problem solving and expanding the pie. What are our available options? Another root cause of conflict can be resources, especially in the church, this is common, because there's com competition when there's a lack of resources. So for instance, there might be a grant that is given out to the churches, but you have to present a proposal in order to find out whether you'll be able to receive that grant. And because there are so many churches, there's a lot of competition in us trying to receive that one grant that's available. So we bicker, we fight, and sometimes we even, sometimes we even may leave out the truth in order for us to receive that grant. So lack of resources can cause us to conflict with one another. Fear is also another cause of conflict. Many church conflicts begin when people become anxious about what is happening, about what is not happening in the church. When anxiety, a certain level of which is healthy in organization, it turns into worry and fear People, lose, people begin to lose their perspective about what is actually going on, and then it creates conflict. In such cases, fear begins to sit on the church, act on the church as pollen does on a person with hay fever. Hay fever sufferers, if you're familiar or if you suffer with hay fever, you'll understand where I'm coming from, are hypersensitive to certain allergies. And when those substances enter their bodies, the immune system reacts strongly, and they become miserable. The body divides sense up to protect them from the harm of the pollen. And so with fear in the church, when we become aware of a problem, we sometimes overact, and the problem becomes worse than what it really is. We act in fear and we lose our ability to think, to think clearly and understand the circumstances accurately. We act or we make decisions that we regret later on. And the last root of conflict that I wanna to talk to you about this morning 
would be needs. Sometimes our needs conflict with the needs of others. And in the church, we have many needs. When the church conflict can begin, the church conflict can begin at a setting because of the variety of the needs that are in the church. Some needs are for education. Some people are desperate for Christian education and some are for other needs in the church like they want more group Bible study and some, some needs are for more studying of the word and then there's other needs for counseling. But how many know that we cannot meet all the needs of the church, therefore it sometimes can cause conflict? Amen? Now I want us to look at the original, the original of conflict. Where did conflict originate from? When you look in the book of James, chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, it reads, where do you think all these appalling wars and quarrels come from? Do you think they just happen? Think again. They come because you want your own way and you fight for it deep inside yourselves. You lust for what you don't have and are willing to kill to get it. You want what isn't yours and will risk violence to get your own way. So in other words, before dealing with conflict, within our, with outside and around us, we must deal with the conflict that is going on inside our own selves. Why do we have, the, why do we have to ask ourselves, why do we have the need to always want to have our own way, instead of using the opportunity to see things in a new and different way? This passage describes the root cause of conflict, and it is the utmost desires in our hearts. When we want something and we feel that we won't be satisfied unless we get it, that desires begin to control us, and especially when it comes from others who do not meet our desires, we start to, condone, to condemn them in our hearts and fight hard to get our way, causing conflict. Now there's a gentleman by the name of Ken Sandy, and he's an author who made a book that talk about the four eyes of conflict. And the four eyes of conflict are, I desire, I demand, I judge, and I punish. And all these eyes are selfish eyes that can cause conflict. I desire conflicts always begin with some kind of desire, with some kind of desire. It, is, it, it, it starts with you wanting to have something of your own desire. Now some desires that are inherently wrong, but some are not, some are okay. Some desires such as vengeance, lust, greed, but there are many other desires that are not wrong such as peace and quiet, respectful children, a loving spouse. The reason that I use those desires as examples is because good desires, good desires is, is most, most of us have good desires at one time or another. It is not these particular desires that causes the conflict. It is the way we approach getting these desires, the way we want the desires fulfilled. That is what causes the conflict, beloved. This leads us to the next I, I demand. When that desire is not met and we feel that we just have to have it, we begin to fight harder to get it and we start to demand what we want. Now it's easy to justify our desires because after all, I, we've worked hard all day and we deserve to have peace and quiet, amen? Now I just wanna have, I just wanna have the kind of intimacy that God intended. Now these are all legitimate requests, but the problem is when these requests are not met, we can find ourselves in a vicious cycle. The more we want something, the more we think we need it, the, desire, the more we think we need the desire, the more we try to get it, and the more we create conflict. I judge. When others don't feel our desires, and they don't give us what we, dem, what we want, or they don't fulfill our demands, when they don't fulfill our needs or satisfy us, 
We criticize and condemn them in our hearts, and if not, we judge them with our words. The last I is I punish. Now this can take many forms, beloved. Sometimes we can act in anger, lashing out with harmful words to inflict pain on those who fail to meet our expectations. When we try to impose guilt onto the person that didn't give us what we want, that didn't give us what we want, amen? You know that for married couples, withdrawal from the other is very common when dealing with conflict. You know what I mean when you stop talking to your spouse or you withhold affection and physical contact because you didn't get what you want can cause conflict. You act sad and you act gloomy and you walk around not making any eye contact. That can cause conflict, beloved. Amen. So we must note as Christians that all these eyes are eyes of selfishness. And selfishness is a major part of conflict. One of the greatest contributions to conflict is selfishness. And Paul admonishes us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, not to be so selfish. But Paul says, don't always be so concerned about yourself and your needs, but be concerned about the needs of others. And think of others higher than yourself. Amen? Anybody know anything about conflict in here? Amen. Anybody know about strong disagreements in here? Anybody know that sometimes we don't get along in here? Amen. How many know that even times in churches we don't get along? Amen. But not this church. Somebody say amen. 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 When you look at it as we're dealing with restoring unity in the church, we got to understand that the church is not just some organization, but it's an organism. It's an interconnection of relationships. And we have to understand that when we are in relationships, there is the real possibility that sometimes relationships can be fractured or broken. In other words, to be restored, as Reverend Gittins has said, that means that something had to be broken in order for it to have the necessity that it has to be restored. And when you really look at the Bible, you could see that conflict started from the beginning. You can even see in, in Isaiah 14, conflict started between God and Satan, where Satan says that I will ascend into heaven. I will rise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the assembly. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I will make a name for the most high. But I love that God always puts a contrast that what the devil said, God switches the equation and says that you will be brought down low to the depths of the pit. Amen. The conflict begun because it started in Satan's heart where he wanted to lift himself up. And that's still some of the major reasons of conflict in the church. The same pride Satan has is what pride comes into the church. It will start to fracture the unity that we're supposed to have. Amen? And you can also see in the book of Genesis, conflict begun between God and Satan because man did not obey what God has commanded him. He says, if you eat of this fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, when you eat of it, you will surely die. And when you look at that word that, that you should surely die, it comes from a Hebrew word that means that not only are you just going to die physically, but you're going to be spiritually dead. And when you are spiritually dead, that means that you are enemy to God. Romans chapter 5. So there became conflict when man broke that commandment of God. It's now become conflict between God and man. Thank God for the cross. Somebody say thank God for the cross. And you could see because of this because of God's grace and mercy, now even conflict has happened between man and Satan. Anybody know Satan is your enemy? I said anybody know Satan is your enemy? Amen. Anybody know Satan is your enemy? Amen. Tap somebody and say, wake up. Tell somebody it's time to wake up. Amen. In Genesis chapter 3 and 15, which is the first evangelistic message 
that God has given. He said that the seed of the woman and the seed of the enemy will now be at conflict with each other. And then the, it goes on and it continues through the scripture. You can see conflict between brothers, Cain and Abel, in, Ge in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Even in the church, sometimes people think that somebody is getting more favoritism than the other. Somebody is getting more blessings than the other. And that can cause conflict in the church. Between Abraham and Lot, in Genesis chapter 13, verse 8, to, to 13 is the conflict over resources where the servants of Abraham and the servants of Lot fought over the best products. How many know that we fight in church over resources? All right, we fight over church over money. Oh, I see. We understand. You hear me? Amen. And you can see that the disciples of Jesus in Mark chapter 9, verse 33 to 37, even they fought amongst each other. Before, whilst Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross, they argued about who is the greatest. Amen. Who is going to be the one lifted up? Anybody know that we have conflict like that? In church conflict, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10 to 12, Paul says, I've heard from Cleo's household that there is a lot of conflict, that there's a lot of quarrels. You're fighting over so many different things. You're fighting over who is the greatest preacher. Anybody seen church fight over who's the best teacher? Oh, okay. Not this church, right? Somebody say amen. 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 And we also understand Paul had to deal with people who refused to accept his leadership. One of the greatest conflicts in the church is that people refuse to accept the godly appointed leadership that is placed over them. Amen. We don't want to be submissive to the leaders that God has placed over the house. Amen. Anybody seen that in the church? All right, let me just talk to the pastors. Anybody seen that in the church? Amen. I see y'all don't understand what I'm talking about. But if you passed it long enough, you always got somebody trying to rise up above your authority. Am I talking to you? Uh-huh. Paul and Barnabas. There was a fight over John Mark because Paul was impatient with the growth of of John Mark. Sometimes as leaders especially, we become impatient with the growth of the sheep and that causes conflict. You think that people should be at a place by now they, that you should be and you've been pushing them and you've been telling them and then they don't seem to want to listen and then they get mad at you because you pushed them and you told them. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, do you hear me? Paul and Peter for it. In Acts chapter 15 and 36, they argued because, no, I think that's the wrong passage. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to verse 21, Paul and Peter fought because Peter, when they wasn't, the Jews wasn't around, he ate with the Gentiles. But when the Jews came around, he just wanted to eat with the Jews. So they had a fight over legalism. They had a fight over doctrine. How many know that the church has many disagreements based on what we believe? Somebody say this is the way. Somebody say that is the way. But how many know that Jesus is the only way? And if we're going to restore unity to the church, Jesus has to be the only way. He is the life. He is the truth. He is the way. His name is Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's even fights between the boss and the employee. In the book of Philemon, Paul had to encourage the, 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 the boss to please accept this servant back into the fold. How many know there's conflict on the job? Amen. How many know there's conflict on the job? Sometimes I don't agree with my boss. And sometimes my boss don't agree with me. But how many know that if you keep this with the boss, you will have no job. So be careful that you agree with the boss. Tell somebody agree with the boss. But if the boss tell you to do something, 
that is against the way of God, then it's a time to disagree with the boss because the boss has a boss and his name is Jesus Christ. There's conflict between the Christian and the world. The Bible says that you cannot be a lover of God and yet be a friend of the world. Amen. There's going to be conflict. Somebody say conflict. And when you look at it, the cross of Jesus Christ is the example on how we are to deal with conflict. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 8, we see that Jesus Christ took the conflict between man and God and took it to the cross. So if we're going to deal with conflict, we have to take it to the cross. Tell somebody, take it to the cross. If you've got to deal with conflict, whether in the world, whether in your home, whether in your marriage, whether with your children, whether in the church, you've got to take it to the cross. Tell somebody, take it to the cross. Amen. So that means that you've got to come with a sense of humility. The Bible says you've got to have the mind of Jesus Christ. That means you've got to understand that I've got to look after the interests of others over even my interests. You see, we got to take it to the cross to have the humility not to push through our own way. we got to have the ability to forgive. How many know that if you're going to restore conflict, you got to have an understanding of forgiveness? you got to forgive. Look at somebody and say, I forgive you. You didn't even do anything to me yet, but I forgive you anyhow. In the Lord's Prayer, it says, Father, forgive them. Amen. For what they do against me. And Lord, let me forgive those, Lord Jesus, who have trespassed against me. The cross allows us to serve. In Romans 12, verse 9 through 11, the Bible says, love sincerely. In other words, don't love somebody falsely. It says to be devoted to one another. Bless those who curse you. Hallelujah. How many have practiced that I have blessed those who have cursed me? Oh, I see one, I see two, I see three, maybe four, five, six hand. Most of your hand not up. When you take it to the cross at times, you have to bless those that you want to punish. Sometimes you got to let things go. Hallelujah. Anybody know what I'm talking about? To take it to the cross, it allows you to love. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27 to 28, the Bible encourages us to love your enemies. Do good to them and pray for them. And in verse 29, it says, do not retaliate against them. This is how we mature. Because a church that is always in conflict is an immature church. The more mature you are in Jesus Christ, you learn to let conflict roll off your back. You learn to be, when God tells you to speak, then you speak. But when God tells you to be quiet, you are quiet. Anybody not listen to God when he tell you to be quiet, you still spoke? God said, shut up, and you still opened your mouth? And then you wonder why you're in conflict? Some people talk too much. Look at somebody and says, he's not talking about you, though. Not you. Look at him again and said, not you. Somebody else. Always got something to say. But not you. Look at him and said, not you. In John 14 and 27, the scripture says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and be not afraid. In other words, our peace is not dependent on what the outside influences. Our peace is dependent on who influences our soul. The world is at conflict, but we cannot fight and be in conflict the way the world does. In Colossians chapter 1, 19 to 20, the scripture says, For God 
in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by the means of Christ's blood on the cross. It's because of the blood of Jesus Christ we have peace. And if the church is preaching Jesus Christ and we are the body of Jesus Christ, then this should be the place where there's the most peace. So the biblical model of handling conflict is found in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to verse 17. Matthew chapter 18. Somebody tell somebody, write this down. You might need this. And it says, if another believer Notice this is talking about the church. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out that offense or wrong. And if the other person listens and confesses it, you have won or reconciled that person. Verse 16, but if you are unsuccessful, take one or two witnesses. Take them with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. I call that gossip protection. You got to take two or three witnesses, those who just don't agree with you, but those who stand on the word of God that can judge between right and wrong. And then verse 17 deals with church discipline. If the person still refuses to listen to godly counsel, take your case to the church. Tell somebody, take it to the church. And then if she or he won't accept the church's decision, then treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. In other words, if you're going to continue to be a disruption in the church, and the church has tried to talk to you privately, and the church has tried to talk to you publicly, and the leaders have tried to talk to you, and you still want to be a disruption in the church, guess what the church says? There's the door. We put you out. You cannot be a disruption to the church. Somebody say you cannot be a disruption in the church. Look at somebody and say, is he talking to you? Why is it so quiet? Is it too early in the morning? Okay. Let's talk about eight things on how we resolve conflict between brothers and sisters in the Lord. Number one, somebody say number one. Is you got to address everyone involved. Address everybody involved. If you're having a conflict with somebody, you don't go to somebody else and talk about them. That's called gossip. And gossip is one of the major divisions in the church. If you have a problem with Sally, then you only talk to Sally. Don't be talking to somebody else. Talk to them. Tell somebody, address everybody involved. Number two, somebody say number two. Avoid if, but, and maybe. If I said something, maybe I said something. I wouldn't have done that, but you said this. Take your responsibility for what you've done and what you said to somebody else. If somebody say they hurt, then guess what? Then respect the possibility that they are hurt. Don't say, if I, I did something. No, you know you did something. Then admit that you did it. Somebody say number three. Admit what you've done specifically. In other words, if you took something from somebody, 
then say, I am sorry for taking this from you. Don't be using all these generalities. I have hurt you. I don't know why you're upset. No, I have done something specifically to you and stay on that point. Don't go on to what somebody did 10 years ago. Have you ever heard somebody when you've done something wrong to them and you try to talk about that wrong you've done to them, they remind you of what you did wrong 10 years ago? Am I talking to somebody? Any married people in here? We're the married people. Raise your hand. Have you ever talked to your spouse and you and you telling your spouse about what happened yesterday and your spouse start to remind you of what happened in 1979? Tell somebody stay on point. Number 4. Somebody say number 4. Acknowledge your hurt. Some people hold everything in and they don't want to admit that they're hurt. Understand your value. If somebody hurt you, you got to be able to say, ouch. If somebody stepped on your toe, anybody ever had your toe stepped on? Don't it hurt? No, some of you got hard foot. Don't it hurt if somebody step on your foot? You got to say, ouch. Let them know that something has hurt you. Number five, accept the consequences. If somebody, if you know you have done something wrong, you got to understand that you're going to have to deal with the consequences of your action. Number six, that you got to change your behavior. You cannot expect change if you're constantly doing the same thing over and over and over again. That's called repentance. Change your way of doing things and do it a different way. So if there's constant conflict, wherever you go, you might have to change. If you're in the church and there's conflict with you in the church, if you at home and there's conflict with you in your home, if you on the job and there's conflict with you on the job, if you got conflict with the motorcycle driver and on the van or in the car, maybe the problem is not with everybody else. Maybe the problem is with you. Tell somebody, but I'm not talking about you. And you got to ask for forgiveness. Number seven, help me to forgive. This don't go to God and ask forgiveness, but we got to learn to ask forgiveness from one another. Amen. And number eight, somebody say eight. You got a loud time. When somebody is offended, just because you over it, don't mean they're going to be over it at the same time. Now, that doesn't mean that you got to hold on to what somebody did to you forever. But you still got to give people time to be able to deal what was done to them. And the whole key to restoring unity in the church is having a clear understanding of forgiveness. The word forgiveness means to remove the guilt resulting from the wrongdoing. So when I am forgiving you, I am saying that I'm not holding you guilty for what you have done. I am pardoning you. I am releasing you. I am letting you go from the sense of my right to retaliate against you. But just because I've forgiven you, does not mean that I forget the wrongdoing that you have done to me. Amen. What it means is I forget the hurt that what you have done for me. Amen. Anybody in here have a problem with forgiving somebody? Raise your hand. So all of you, the rest of you who did not raise your hand, you have no problem forgiving somebody. Raise your hand if you say I have no problem forgiving somebody. Okay, I'm watching your hand because I'm going to step on your toe right after I leave this service. I already heard somebody said they better not step on my toe. <laughs> Don't step it, I step on it hard. Forgiveness is surrendering my right to hurt you for hurting me. When I forgive, I surrender my right to hurt you for hurting me. 
And 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, verse 18 says, So if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And this is the verse that I like. And all of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself, to Jesus Christ, and has given to us all the ministry of reconciliation. You got to understand that we all have a ministry. It has been given to us by God. And reconciliation or, or is a restoration of friendly relationships and of the peace where before there has been hostility and isolation and alienation. And it means to remove the offense that causes the disruption, the peace. And harmony, which means that if Christ can reconcile the world to himself, we got to be reconciled together. We all have a ministry. That means I don't care what ethnic group you come from. I don't care what language that you come from. I don't care what tribe you come from. I don't care what church you come from. I don't care what denomination you come from. I don't care which leader that you serve. I am a minister of Jesus Christ, and I'm not going to let anything disrupt our peace. Look at somebody and say, you have a ministry. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5 and 19, for God was in Christ restoring the world to himself, no longer counting men's sins against him, but he was blotting him out. Amen. To, in Ephesians 2 and 16 deals with how the cross breaks out tribal associations because now we are one family. Look at somebody and say, you're my family in Christ. It says, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. In other words, the cross kills anything that causes disruption between me and you. And the Bible tells us and warns us what happens if we do not forgive. And Ma Matthew chapter 6 14 and 15, it says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive you your sins. We have a command that we have to let it go. We have to forgive each other because when you don't forgive each other, you bring bitterness into the church. And then you're at war in the church. And you go from one church to the next church to the next church to the next church bringing bitterness and unforgiveness into the church. Colossians 3 and 13 and 14 says, make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony or peace. The church is supposed to be loving one another. And love brings peace and joy with it. Amen. In Ephesians 4 and 31 and verse 32 tells us what we got to do. Our responsibility. It says get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander and all types of evil behavior. You can't pray that. You got to do that. You got to do something about it. We got to do something about it. We cannot bring this into the church. It says instead be kind to one another. Just give somebody a smile. Look at somebody and give them a big smile. Look at you, some of you can't even do that. We got conflict right now. Come here, let me step on your toe. I think we stepping on your toe already. Look at somebody and give them a smile. It's easy, look. There you go. Don't you look much better? Don't you feel better when you smile? Look at the beautiful smile. Some of you still looking at me mod. Come, let me step on your toe.
Paul reminds us that we deal with conflict in a new way. There is going to be conflict in the church. You know why? Because we're in the church. And we all got to crucify this flesh. And we all got to die more so that God can live more in us. So we bring all types of stuff into the church. And we need God's help to be able to live and to be at peace and harmony with one another. Somebody say amen. amen. So as we understand, beloved, that there's also benefits to conflict. Conflict is not always bad. Now I have 25 reasons why conflict can be a benefit. But I'm not gonna go through all of them. I just want to see if y'all was awoke. Amen. I'm just gonna talk about five benefits this morning. The first benefit of conflict is we, are, we have the ability to create new ideas. So when we start to see someone else's point of view, or you may come up with an entirely new way to view things based on what the argument or the conflict was about. Paying attention and really listening to other people is a key benefit to resolving church conflict. Amen? Amen. Another benefit to church con resolving church conflict is that you learn about others. Conflict is a way to learn more about other people. It's a, an opportunity, whether an, it's an argument with a significant other or a boardroom member, a colleague, or a church member, Facing conflict is a great way to learn more about them. If you pay attention, beloved, you'll learn not only about the particular argument or conflict, but you'll also learn about the way that they choose to handle the conflict. Another benefit to conflict resolution in the church is you understand a little bit more about yourself. Another surprising benefit is that you can learn so many great things about yourself when handling church conflict. You learn not only what you believe about the conflict, but you also learn more about how you choose to raise your points and to make your view visible. What we also learn when we are handling church conflict, we learn about ourselves because we learn how we, what buttons pushes us to react in the way that we do towards the conflict. If you listen to what you're saying and you pay close attention to your body language, you can learn a great deal about yourself and about your style and how you handle conflict, amen? amen. Another benefit to handling church conflict is you can see a different perspective. Now there's nothing wrong with looking at an, uh, an argument or viewing an argument from another's perspective as, a perception, as long as it's according to the word of God, amen? Amen. Whether or not you agree with that person in the conflict, engaging in conflict will also allow you the opportunity to see different perspectives. If you remain open to listen to others and keep an open mind and be willing to hear their side of the story, you might not agree, but you can agree to, dis you can agree to disagree. Amen. Another benefit to conflict resolution is you have the opportunity to practice communication. Communication is a critical aspect of living a positive life. And dealing with church conflict is one way to practice good communication. The less you engage with conflict, the less practice you have to communicate and to learn about other people. But the more you engage in conflict, the more you practice it, this is how you get an opportunity to engage in productive communication. Now, don't be afraid of participating in conflict, beloved, because like we said, conflict is not all bad. Conflict gives us an opportunity to grow, to understand one another, to see and view things in another perspective. And church conflict can be healthy, amen? Now, we also must note it might be te attempting to avoid conflict when it comes your way. But you must realize that there is much to be gained when we're facing church conflict. We need to confront 
church conflict head on. Because if we allow the conflict to remain in the church, there will be division. Amen? And our goal is to restore unity in the church. So church conflict must be addressed. And it must be addressed according to the word of God. Amen? Waiting to deal with this, waiting to deal with church conflict can be good sometimes. And sometimes it can be bad. Because some things have to be dealt with immediately. And we have to be able to discern when we need to address church conflict immediately or when we need to wait a while until things calm down so that we don't confront, con cause any more disconfusion. So we must be very discerning into understanding and knowing when to deal with church conflict and when to deal with it later on. Conflict can be a hard thing to face. But I do believe that it is valuable when we address church conflict. Oddly enough, a lot of positive things come from church conflict when we fight right. Now, how do we deal with church conflict? There's three ways that we can deal with church conflict. We can escape it, we can escalate it, or we can end it. Now, we don't want to escape the conflict because, like I said before, we must address the church conflict in order to restore unity in the church. We don't want to have any conflict lingering around unaddressed because it causes disunity. So, another way that we um, deal with conflict is we es escalate it. What am I saying? We deny the very existence that conflict exists. How many of us know that sometimes we know that there's division and conflict in the church, but we refuse to address it because of fear of, of maybe not being liked or for fear of how the person is going to uh, respond to addressing it? But we understand that we must deal with church conflict and other, to keep it from escalating and blowing up even more than what it is. So we cannot try to act like it's not there. We cannot ignore the role that we've played in participating or creating that conflict in the church. Amen? And another way that we can escalate church conflict is what we call um, verbal escalation. Now, with verbal escalation, there's two ways that we can escalate it verbally. There's something called direct escalation, and those are direct put-downs. Those are yelling, are obscenities to anyone. Then we have indirect escalation, which involves gossip like Reverend Gittin spoke about earlier. It involves gossip and, and slandering other people's names. How many know that would cause church conflict? Amen? How many know that gossip and slander causes church conflict? Nobody knows that but me. All right, I'll move on then. We also have extra verbal escalation. What, are th what is that? Extra verbal escalation means that the conflict between the people become aggressive. And it, be it can become physical, like slapping or hitting or fighting. And this is how domestic violence comes into play. So we know that we must address extra verbal escalation because we don't want it to resolve into something such as domestic or physical violation. Amen? Amen. <laughs> he was so busy taking my picture that he forgot it's his turn. <laughs> but we're not in conflict. <laughs> Stay up here. Amen. As we understand that the church is a body. So when we're in conflict, when the body's in conflict with the body, then we're fighting against ourselves. And when a body fights against ourselves, it's called cancer. Conflict, when not properly addressed and not properly dealt with, is a cancer to the body of Jesus Christ. And what do we do with cancer? We kill it. We renounce it. We rebuke it. We cut it out. Amen. And the way that we cut it out is through the healing of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that unites us all together into one body. Amen. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, the 
the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. In other words, the Holy Spirit allows you to be in unity and relationship in Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit also baptizes you into the church, which is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that helps us deal with conflict courageously, that we don't run from it, we don't hide from it, we do not accept it, but we also realize the value of it, that we can be reconciled in Jesus Christ. So we need the stamp of God's Holy Spirit upon us to be able to deal with conflict in the church. In other words, we got to surrender in order for conflict not to be a cancer in our church. And surrender means, Lord, teach me your way how to do things. Teach me your way how to say things. Teach me when to say it, when not to say it, if to say it. Lord, I surrender unto your way. Your will becomes my will. Your way becomes my way. I let you be the one that retaliates against my enemy. I'm not going to continue to fight and bring destruction to the church of the living God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. And then I got to pray, Lord, help me with my tongue. Help me with my ears. Help me with my hands. And if I'm a source of conflict, I got to ask God to give me. If I'm a source of conflict, I got to go to my leaders and say, God, forgive me. If I've hurt somebody, I got to go to them and say, forgive me. You don't wait for them to come to you. You go to them. The Bible says even in the midst of worship, don't even leave your gift at the altar and go ask forgiveness and reconcile with your brother and your sister. And the altar is a place where we become reconciled. The altar right here is a place where we get married at the altar. We give our life to Jesus Christ at the altar. We enter into covenant and communion together at the altar. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to bring some people to the altar. Because we cannot go further. If you're looking for this great manifestation, you cannot be a source of division, rebellion, and conflict in the church. You cannot be a source of division and conflict even in your home. We need the Holy Spirit. Anybody know we need the Holy Spirit? So if you were here today, and you know conflict follows you. Everywhere you go, there's warfare. If you are here today, and you know there's conflict between you and your pastors. If you are here today, and you know that you have a hard time forgiving somebody. If you are here today, and you need to ask forgiveness, then I ask you to meet us at the altar. Is there anybody here? Is there anybody here? Is there anybody here? I will ask you, please stop the walking. Please stop the walking. Please stop the walking. It's an altar call right now. Please stop the walking. I said, please stop the walking. Please stop the walking. Please stop the walking. Excuse me, excuse me, please stop the walking. If you are a pastor and you are walking, you are being disobedient right now. And you cannot expect people to follow you if you cannot respect what is going on right now. Please stop the walking. Are you here today and you know there's a source of conflict in your life? God to help you to forgive and be forgiven, then come to the altar. Is there anybody here? Why don't you come? Why don't you come? If you know you have a problem forgiving somebody, then you need to come at this altar. I know there are people here. I know there's people here. This is your source of deliverance right now. Is there anybody here? I have been a source of conflict in my life. 
Some of it I brought on myself. Is there anybody here? Is there anybody else here? Then why don't you come? Is there anybody else? If you have been disobedient and rebellious to your leader, you're not on the place where you're supposed to be. You're not doing what you're supposed to be for the building up of the church. Then why don't you come? Why don't you come? This is more than just a shout. This is about getting delivered. Why don't you come? Come, come, come. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Is there anybody else? Then why don't we stand as we pray for our brothers and sisters who are bold enough to come to the altar. There's some more of you that need to come. As our ministers are praying for you. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, I don't want to be a source of disruption. I don't want to be a source of rebellion. I don't want to be a source of manipulation. I don't want to be a source of disruption in the body of Jesus Christ. Lord, help me to be submitted to not only God, but to godly leadership. Help me in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to follow and catch the vision in the name of the Lord Jesus that God has given to his leaders. Lord, help me to be forgiving because you have forgiven me. And Lord God, help me to ask forgiveness of those that I have offended. Lord, help me in the name of the Lord Jesus to be restored into the body of Jesus Christ. And God, as you delivered me, fill me. As you deliver me, help me. And God, I believe in every area of my life, God, you're changing it around. That the warfare within and the warfare without is now over. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. I call peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ into my life. I call peace into my household. I call peace into my church. I cause harmony everywhere I go. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord. You don't just give me peace. You are my peace. Hallelujah. If you need peace, just give a wave offering to the Lord. And shout unto the Lord, give me peace. Give me peace. Give me peace. That peace is enough power to still the storms in your life. Jesus said, peace, be still. I call peace today. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Is there anybody else? You got two seconds. If you know you need to be at this altar and the Holy Spirit is calling you, I know there's more. I know there's more. And you can say, I don't understand you, preacher, but I know the Holy Ghost can speak to you. Is there one more? Then come to this altar. If you leave this place and you know that you have conflict and you are the source of conflict, do not expect all the blessings that you're waiting for. You cannot expect it. We got to be in order. Is there one more? Is there one more? Is there one more? Hallelujah. 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 Yeah, Oh, we bless you, God. Oh, we bless you, mighty God. We honor you, Lord God. We honor your presence here, Lord Jesus. We believe, God, that you are in the midst of your people right now, God. And Lord, we surrender our conflict unto you, Lord God. We understand, God, that we must be, Lord God, in right relationship for you, God. 
before we can ask anything of you, Lord God, before we can expect any blessings from you, God, we know that we must be in right relationship before you, God. So God, as my brothers and sisters that are kneeling at this altar, has surrendered, Lord God, all of the conflict, Lord, that has been a part of their lives, Lord God, that has caused them to be separated from your presence, Lord. Lord God, we thank you because we know that you are restoring even right now, Lord God. Lord God, your word says that when we ask anything in your name, it shall be given unto us. So God, we thank you and we receive restoration and unity right now in my brothers and sisters' lives today, God. And we appreciate, Lord God, the power of your Holy Spirit that allows us to forgive ourselves and to forgive others. So Holy Spirit, have your way at this altar. Move like only you can move. From heart to heart and breastplate to breastplate. And God, as they rise from the altar and return to their seats, God, may they not return to their seats the same way that they left it, God. But may they be renewed in the power of the Holy Ghost uh, as they walk, Lord God, in holiness and righteousness because you are holy, God, and you expect us to live holy and righteous uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, thank you, Holy Spirit, uh, for joining and restoring every broken piece in this sanctuary today, God. Uh, even those who did not come to the altar that know that they should have come to the altar. God, have mercy upon them, Lord. Uh, have mercy, O oh Lord. Hallelujah for mercy suits this case, Lord God. Hallelujah, Holy Spirit. Restore, regenerate, renew, revive. In Jesus' name, let the church say, Hallelujah. 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 Touch me, Lord. Ah. 
something happened and now I know He touched me He will touch you Turn your life around Make a change in you He will make you whole He will make you whole He will make you whole Yeah He touched me And he made me old. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Please uh, keep your question. We are going to ask question at the last, at the end of the second teaching. So please put your hands together as I welcome our mother, our auntie, our auntie, Bishop Mrs. Abadia. Put your hands together for her. Put your hands together immediately. God bless you, ma. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Praise Master Jesus. I read something yesterday on a post that somebody posted on Facebook. He said, tonight, two things must happen. And the person said, he said, November must come to an end and December must emerge. And the person now said, so shall everything that trouble you come to an end. If you are in this house, you will shout a better amen. Everything that troubled your life from January to November has been put to end. It has gone with November for life. In the name of Jesus. The way November 2015 can never come again. That is how that, those situations will never come again. In the name of Jesus. If you are in this house, turn it to prayers. Turn it to prayers. Those things that trouble you. Those things that trouble you.